Right. So back in July, there was this raid in two states, in Florida and Missouri, of members of the African People's Socialist Party. And this raid came in conjunction with an indictment of a Russian national for allegedly acting uh, to sow discord in the U.S., the typical Russiagate uh, playbook charges. And the African People's Socialist Party, their members were raided in these two states because they were basically named in the indictment as unindicted co-conspirators. Some an alleged Russian agent seeking to basically uh, spread Kremlin propaganda in the U S and these members of the African people's socialist party were named in that indictment. Well, now just this week, uh, those members of that party, four members, three of them are current members. One of them is a former member were indicted. And here's the announcement from the justice department, U S citizens and Russian intelligence officers charged with conspiring to use U S citizens as illegal agents of the Russian government. Defendants sought to sow discord, spread pro Russia propaganda and interfere in elections within the United States. So first of all, look at what the justice department says they did here. So discord and spread pro-Russia propaganda. Putting aside whether they actually did that or not, is that now illegal to, quote, so discord and spread pro-Russia propaganda? Um, yeah, and how can an American interfere in an American election? Exactly, exactly. And what's actually being done here is the Justice Department is using the Russiagate playbook, which is to basically smear anybody who dissents from the national security state as a Russian agent, to go after black radicals. And if you read the indictment, there's ba- they, they, they accuse them of not filling out a form uh, as agents of the Russian government. Uh, that's the actual charge. But the, the, the content of the indictment is basically goes after the content of their speech. It, 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 it mentions how they criticize the proxy war in Ukraine, how they point out that Nazis are incorporated into Ukraine's armed forces and we are funding those armed forces. It basically goes after the content of their speech. And what it says when it comes to an actual criminal offense is that they acted as re- as agents of the Russian government without filling out a form to do that, when really all they have in the way of evidence is that these defendants interacted with some Russians and they received a pretty small amount of money for some of their activities. It's like but, several hundred dollars, right? Yeah. And and they're and basically, but this what they what they're doing though is basically sharing opinions that they've been sharing for their entire political lives. And one of the defendants is Amalia Shatella, who's like in his 80s. He's been an activist for decades. And he's been saying this, you know, he's been criticizing the U.S. government forever. But now what the government is basically saying that he's doing this at the behest of the Kremlin. And this is the result, the direct outgrowth of Russiagate, in which the national security state decided that basically whoever was not conducive to its interests, whoever was calling for diplomacy with Russia, whoever was challenging the imperatives of the CIA, that they were a Russian agent. And this is being dusted off to go after now these black activists. Yeah, and it's pretty clear that uh, after Russiagate, the whole hysteria had been stirred up. There was pressure at the DOJ to do indictments to back up what we've been constantly hearing from Maddow, from the mostly from the blue wing of the corporate media, but also from Adam Schiff, the Senate and House Democrats, which is that there were actual Russian agents of influence inside the U.S. who were interfering and sowing discord. Um, And constantly we heard that Black Lives Matter had been influenced by Russian bots, by the fraudmeister Clint Watts, who we'll talk about later, who's exposed as just a complete huckster at the head of this Hamilton 68 bot tracker. We constantly heard that. And so it's kind of baked into the liberal cake at the base of the Democratic Party that these cells exist very much like very, very reminiscent of the way that the Republican base believed that terror cells were everywhere. And they had been essentially told that by the president. And there was pressure on the John Ashcroft Justice Department John Ashcroft applying the pressure himself to f- nab some Muslim leadership in the U.S., put them on trial and high profile trials and prove that they were taking down the network of terror inside the U.S. So that's what I think. This is a political case, um, but there's also pressure locally from the St. Petersburg Democrats. I think this is my mm-hmm. theory. They've definitely come out and supported this indictment to get rid of these troublemakers who are in their midst, who are constantly running in elections and mobilizing a small slice of the local black population 
for an independent party that is not part of the Democratic Party. And we know how the Democrats feel about independent candidates from Ralph Nader to Jill Stein. They want to destroy them by any means. And let's take the charges at face value just for a second. Okay, so these black leftists are accused of taking, you know, hundreds, maybe maybe thousands of dollars from some Russians for political activities. When foreign governments like, you know, Belarus or Russia or whoever else, you know, charge people in their country with acting as agents of the U.S., uh, the U.S. always cries foul and claims that this is, you know, a crackdown on, on freedom. And the difference is that when the U.S. does it, they spend not hundreds or thousands of dollars. They spend tens of millions of dollars on trying to sow discord <laughs> abroad and trying to, you know, use people for U.S. political goals. I mean, Victoria Nuland in Ukraine alone, she bragged that the U.S. spent billions of dollars on promoting pro-Western forces, uh, which were then deployed for the 2014 coup. That's actual uh, malign influence in sowing discord because it leads to things like a coup in Ukraine. Here we're talking about some uh, random activists, you know, getting money for, in this case, uh, apparently the, some Russians gave them money for a speaking tour to say things they've always been saying. And now when, uh, and now the U.S. is doing, is charging people for what it condemns other governments of doing. So the difference is other governments, uh, in the case of foreign countries, the U.S. spends tens of millions in in some cases, billions of dollars on those activities. Yeah, April 18th, uh, 2018, almost just a few days ago was the anniversary of April 18th, 2018, when gangs of hooligans took over large swaths of Nicaragua and laid siege to the country's economy and people left hundreds dead in order to overthrow the elected Sandinista government, targeted Sandinistas across the country. This is something I covered interviewed victims of the violence. This was spawned by the U.S. By, through meddling in, the, in Nicaraguan politics, civil society, media, by laying the groundwork for insurrection in the words of a publication funded by the National Endowment for Democracy, the regime change arm of the U.S. government, which spawns coups, color revolutions, and topples uh, leaders the U.S. doesn't like through elections all, all over the world. This was a violent attempt to use illegal and some would say terrorist activity to overthrow the government of Daniel Ortega outside of democratic confines. And it was funded by the National Endowment for Democracy. This is a report I did uh, just two months into the, what, what you could call a rebellion, but was really a textbook insurrection. And I wrote about how Nicaraguan student protest leaders, you can see them here with like uh, Marco Rubio and Ileana Ross Leighton, the former Congresswoman from Florida, um, they meet, met with neocons in D.C. And a publication funded by the NED boasts of spending millions of dollars laying the groundwork for insurrection. And here we have, you know, the receipts. This is on the new NED's website. I mean, these are hundreds of thousands of dollars to um, global Americans. That's the publication. Uh, then we have, you know, there's Ted Cruz meeting with the students. These students were brought up by Freedom House, which is another group funded by the U.S. government, funded by the U.S. taxpayer. Then here's more forms uh, to IEEPP, which is one of one of the major groups at the forefront of this violent insurrection in Nicaragua, $60,000, $55,000 from the NED. And then we had money from the USAID. This happens in countries around the world. And then the US goes and indicts people for getting a few hundred bucks from Russia and then using deploying what they call propaganda, which is a completely neutral term and is basically prosecuting them for their speech, connecting them going on a conference in Russia, two things they said. So the point is the U.S. spends millions and millions more than Russia did on this organization that the FBI is indicting. And the U.S. does so not just to interfere in elections, but to actually carry out insurrections that make January 6th look like a Shriners parade. <laughs> and of course... Like, what is this charge? It's going back to the McCarthy era, going back to the time when Dr. King was smeared as a Soviet agent. This is the classic playbook. And where are liberals on this? Liberals have branded themselves, especially since 2020, when they use this to help get Biden elected, as being for Black Lives Matter. Yeah. I mean, supporting the George Floyd protests, using that as a get out the vote operation for Democrats. So where are they now 
when black activists are being smeared as Russian agents and being indicted for their speech. If you look at MSNBC, I've seen no coverage of this indictment at all, um, which is especially amazing given that when anybody gets you know, charged or suspected of having anything to do with Russia, places like MSNBC are all over it. Like it, if there's any Russian agent develop, like related news, like the case of Maria Butina, for example, uh, that Russian lady who was imprisoned uh, for a long time because she allegedly failed to register as a Russian agent while going to Republican events. They were all over that case. She was smeared as a spy. In this case, there's nothing. And why is that? Because they know that they face a problem. So they promoted this Russiagate mania for whatever, six years. But they also know that, they also know that they've branded themselves as being pro-Black Lives Matter. Uh, but now you have a contradiction because your allies, th their allies have been throughout this, the FBI and the CIA. Well, now the FBI is using Russiagate to go after black activists. So the response, they can't condemn it because that would go after their traditional allies in the FBI. And also it would expose the real uses, the real goals of Russiagate, which is to smear genuine dissent to the national security state. So their only response is just silence. Yeah. Silence from not just the people who are depicted here. Uh, Nancy Pelosi, <laughs> Chuck Schumer and Kent Day cloth. Um, you know, but silence from the groups that declared a rebellion for racial justice to destroy the virus of racism in the U S and uh, we're talking about black lives matter, the organization itself. I don't think they've said anything about this. Um, what happened with Black Lives Matter after they their brand really took off and they got out in the streets and got waves of Americans out in the street? Well, here's what happened. $220 million from the Open Society Foundations, which is the foundations of anti-communist billionaire George Soros, who is hell-bent on regime change in Russia and is the top funder of the Democratic Party. So basically, co-optation, complete co-optation of uh, the major activists involved in BLM, including the figures like Alicia Garza, who've gone on high paid lecture tours, who have just soaking in foundation money. They created that brand. And basically what they did was they co-opted themselves. They opened up the, the they paved the way for the co-optation of a rebellion that started in places like Ferguson outside yep. St. Louis and in Baltimore. And that didn't have a brand at that time. And they brought it back into the ranks of the Democratic Party. Uh, they brought black civil society back into the, into the confines of the Democratic Party. And then they wound up, the leaders of Black Lives Matter, they, the, these three women who founded it, they wound up endorsing Elizabeth Warren over Bernie Sanders. Here's the uh, long the uh, traditional CIA cutout known as the Ford Foundation. Well, it used to be a pass-through for the CIA. I don't know what it does now. $180 million uh, for U.S. racial justice ex efforts. Look at the date on this, October 9th, 2020. So basically, BLM had begun to die down because the election was coming up. And if Biden was going to be elected, then there would be no need for this movement any longer, which had already been corralled by the Democrats. So they're basically paying them to go home, to go away, go into little NGOs and do cultural critiques and go into universities and just stay out of the streets. That's what this is about. And so we can see that one of the few groups that's left in the streets that's actually out there that's condemning U.S. empire, where, where do they get? They, what do they get? They get a militarized raid on the home of their leader. And an indictment threatening them with years in prison. Uh, and remember, during George Floyd, you even had senior officials from the Obama administration now, and now the Biden administration, like Susan Rice, getting out there to use the protest to fear monger about Russia and also basically send a tacit threat to the protest to keep them in line, to keep them within acceptable bounds, to denounce so-called extremism on both sides, basically painting an equivalence between so-called extremists even inside the Black Lives Matter movement. So this is Susan Rice using the Russiagate uh, boogeyman during the George Floyd protests. Uh, and they are probably also, I would bet based on my experience, I'm not reading the intelligence uh, today uh, or these days, but based on my experience, this is right out of the Russian playbook as well. But we can't allow the extremists, 
the foreign actors to distract from the real problems we have in this country that are longstanding, centuries old, and need to be addressed responsibly by new leadership. You're, you're absolutely right on the uh, foreign interference, because we know for decades, the Russians, uh, when it was the Soviet Union, the communists, they've uh, often, often tied, tried to embarrass the United States by promoting the, the racial divide in our country. But what you're suggesting, Ambassador, is that they're still trying to do that? Is that what you're saying? Well, we see it all the time. We've seen it for years and, and frankly, every day on social media where they take uh, any divisive, painful issue, whether it's immigration, whether it's gay rights, whether it's gun violence and always racism, and they play on both sides. Their aim is not simply to embarrass the United States, Wolf. Their aim is to divide us, to cause us to come into combat with each other, to disintegrate from within. And I would not be surprised to learn that they have fomented some of these extremists on both sides using social media, I wouldn't be surprised to learn uh, that they're funding it in some way, shape, or form. Well, that kind of reminds me, I'm trying to find the video clip, but I can't find it, but Kamala Harris actually blamed Russia for Kaepernick taking a knee. On She was on The Breakfast Club. Can't find the video right now. But uh, yeah, that was consistent with, uh, you know, not just Maddow, but the black leadership that was brought into or around the Biden administration, blaming Russia for acts of black civil resistance. It was happening at the highest level. So, yeah. I got that Kamala clip. It's a, it's a classic. Beautiful. So that's what they start to do, right? That's what they start to do. They did it then, they will do it now. You know, people have said, if you look at, for example, the whole, remember the whole, the heat that ended up around the bend the knee and Colin Kaepernick. Mm -hmm. Many heat. smart people have said it actually was not a thing. Mm -hmm. The Russian bots started taking that on. <laughs> you feel like you're being targeted by Russian bots now? Well, we already know we are. Oh, man. The heat. She could, she could barely even like articulate what she's trying to say, but she basically, she said that was not even a thing. In other words, there weren't these, there wasn't this protest that took over the NFL that eventually put so much pressure on the owners, including anti, former anti-civil rights protester and Dallas Cowboys owner, Jerry Jones, that he actually had to get on the field and take a knee, that it was Russian bots who somehow made that happen. And I know where she got that from Hamilton 68. Yeah, of course. The whole thing, by the way, is like on top of being uh, just ridiculous. It's so fundamentally racist. It's so condescending toward black people. The idea, the presumption underlying all of this is that black people are so malleable that these uh, malicious foreign powers can manipulate to, you know, for their ends. So use them in the case of the African People's Socialist Party to spread pro-Kremlin pro -Kremlin propaganda, or in the case of Colin Kaepernick, that it's Russians that are behind that, not Colin Kaepernick and people who support him protesting real police violence, to the point where Hillary Clinton was also saying that Russian bots were able to convince people not to vote for her in 2016. This is what she said. <laughs> I mean, we're going to have a lot of problems. And the thing we have to do is get enough people to turn out so that they can't you know, steal those votes through suppression in Wisconsin or convince blacks not to vote in this. Convince blacks not to vote. Time, which was very effective and the Russians played a big role in. The, the Russians, Russians convinced convince blacks, blacks not to vote. Yeah, yeah, they're, 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 she's just saying black people are stupid dupes. It's like when Kamala Harris went on, uh, I don't think it was The Breakfast Club or some other urban radio station. And she was just talking down to black people like they were stupid children and saying, Russia's a big country and Ukraine is a small country and the big country attacked the small country. And that's why we have to defend the small country. Like you clearly think that the base of the Democratic Party is stupid if you're talking to them that way um, and specifically black people. So, yeah. <laughs> and and that's, you know uh, like going back to your original point, how you started the segment mentioning Jesse Jackson, you know, who was running for president in the 1980s and, you know, achieved some success, you know, attracted a movement of people. 
you compare who who the black candidates, the black politicians who the Democratic Party elevates now, and it's all people like this, Obama, Susan Rice, Kamala Harris, who all talk down to p- people in a stark contrast to Jesse Jackson who wanted to uplift black people and uplift actually all oppressed people. Uh, and that this is who now the party features. It's people like Kamala and Susan Rice and, and Obama who talk down and also parrot these insane propaganda campaigns designed to undermine actual black leftists and actual leftists in this country. Well, let's hear from Omali Yeshatella. Look, I, I'm, I, I can't say that uh, I'm speaking like with total affinity for this party or that I s- support everything they stand for, but they are an anti-imperialist party. And, you know, he he actually, Omali Yeshatella's, uh, one, of, one of the party members appeared at the Rage Against the War Machine rally in February uh, and spoke there. And Chairman O'Malley spoke at a rally a month later. Um, and, it, you know, I don't know if there's any, but he's here, he's speaking against the indictment. Uhuru! As it has been said, my name is O'Malley Eshatela. I'm chairman of the African People's Socialist Party and chairman of the Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and reparations. <laughs> On July 29th, at five o'clock in the morning, pre-dawn, the an army of assault weapons toting, camouflage wearing military forces identifying themselves as the FBI attacked my home. They, they use flashbang grenades, armored vehicles. They threatened my life and threatened my wife. They used drones. This was in St. Louis, Missouri, the most economically depressed sector of that city. At the same time, on the white side of St. Louis, they attacked a movement solidarity movement and they use battering rams also there knock down doors they held people hostage handcuffed at gunpoint as they did me and my wife who they whom they handcuffed and zip tied in front of our homes they declare that despite the fact that i have been involved in fighting this system for most of the 81 years that I have been alive. This, this, despite the fact that I have opposed every predatory war that the United States, which by the way, is the strategic enemy of all of humanity, despite the fact that I have always done that, that they have declared that black people are so stupid that it takes Russians to tell us that we are oppressed. I have never known a moment of black freedom for my entire life. I have never read of a moment since the beginning of a colonial mode of production where black people have been free. And yet they're saying that we are working, we are agents of some foreign power because we say black people must be free. Because So, I mean, he's saying two important, making two important statements there. One, Russia doesn't need to tell him to condemn U.S. empire because he sees himself as an African person, as a target of U.S. empire, a victim of U.S. empire. And two, his home was targeted in a militarized raid with literal uh, robots, bomb robots, lasers, and a a tactical SWAT team wearing full body armor, just invading his home with assault weapons out. This is an 80 year old man. This is such overkill. It's so out of control. And so we are seeing the casualties of Russia gate in real time. 